Welcome, I'm Tracy Smith and this is Here Comes the Sun, a closer look at the people, places and things we bring you every weekend on Sunday morning. Hollywood heavyweight Ridley Scott is known for his epic films like Gladiator and Thelma and Louise. He's tackling another larger-than-life story in Napoleon as he examines the man behind the military might. Mark Phillips caught up with him. Director Ridley Scott decided his epic take on Napoleon, played by Walking Phoenix, Action. would be less another history lesson and more a character study. Where do you start on a story as big as Napoleon? You've got 10,400 books to start. There's one book written every week since he died. By the time you get book thousand, dude, I think it's gonna be a lot of speculation. Later in the show, Ridley Scott on Napoleon's ambitions. In Napoleon's terms, though, do you, do you think he had that revelation past the point of his imperial success in terms of reorganizing France the way he did, in terms of creating modern Western Europe the way he did? I mean, probably the first major thing he was able to do as a young man was to look and reflect on the old god who are, who are indulging and running France badly. Mm -hmm. Therefore, whatever was coming was almost justified, right? The revolution, the guillotining, and it, it, then it went too far. And I think he was amidst all of that. And, and don't forget, he is poor Corsican, middle-class family, who decided the only way to move up in life was to become a soldier. And so I think Napoleon probably was blessed with marvelous intuition. Then from film to television, FX's hit TV show, The Bear, was inspired by a real Chicago restaurant where the signature sandwich attracts locals and visitors alike. I got to see what makes each bite so special. All right, buddy, what can we get you? Let me get uh, four beef. This is Mr. Beef. Juicy? Yes, sir. The place was both the inspiration for The Bear. Here's a Polish and a monster and the place where they shot the pilot. Walking in here is like stepping into the show. Your hot beef, buddy. Hot beef. And for the hardcore Italian beef eaters who line up day after day, it does not disappoint. That's all coming up right here on Here Comes the Sun. Director Ridley Scott got a late start in the industry, directing his first film in his 40s. At 85, he has no plans to slow down, with several films in production. Mark Phillips sat down with him to discuss his career and his film, Napoleon. Majestic! Prepare to fire! Fire! Any casual student of history knows how the story of Napoleon Bonaparte ends. Waterloo. 1815, after more than two decades of dominating European battlefields and European history, Napoleon was finally confronted by an enemy he couldn't outmaneuver, outgun, or outsmart. Never surrender for homeland and glory! Napoleon, that once obscure outsider from Corsica, the artillery officer who, through ruthlessness and cunning, rose to rule France and to conquer much of Europe, died defeated, in exile, and alone. His remains now lie in this grand tomb in Paris, a testament to an emperor who brought glory and then destruction to his own country. But history and Hollywood aren't finished with him yet. Have you been to this place before? Have you been to no, Invalid before? No, never, never, no, never, 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 never. Director Ridley Scott decided his epic take on Napoleon, played by Walking Phoenix, Action. would be less another history lesson and more a character study. Where do you start on a story as big as Napoleon? You've got 10,400 books to start. There's one book written every week since he died. By the time you get book thousand, dude, I think it's going to be a lot of speculation. So all these historians that have piled on you saying, you know, no, Mary no, 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 hair wasn't no, no, that you're, long, you're, no, I'm not going to walk into that death no. <laughs> Are you <laughs> kidding me? So, sorry, beep. Uh, we then glean the best of the best. So I don't think it's a history lesson. I think it's a character study. 
with violence, with action, with everything you've got. I think you've got everything in there. Wait! Let them think they have the higher ground. The history books are full of Napoleon's triumphs. Send them the infantry! Take their position on the higher ground! But there was another aspect of his life that Scott thinks history hasn't stressed enough. Why are you staring at me? Emma. Hmm. Yes? I was not. Oh, he went. Josephine, the aristocratic widow who became Napoleon's obsession, wife, and empress. What was most telling were the letters of Bonaparte to Josephine, because mm. I wanted the centerpiece of the story not to be just about battles, but about why this Achilles heel toward this woman, which is not about sex, about social graces. She could lead him into a room where he didn't know how to walk. She could do that. You want to be great. She may have also been, according to Scott, the only person without. to tell him to his face what he really was. You are just a brute that is nothing without me. You make him out as a bit of a bumbler in his, in his love it, it, life. Well, a bumbler on a personal level, but in the military level, no. Gifted. Right. But do you draw a connection between the two? We go back to this idea of the Napoleonic complex, that it's somehow compensation. The reputation is that he was a little man, and now we refer to little man with grander ambitions as having Napoleon. You know, I think that's the popular concept, but when he's that successful, who gives a <laughs> Are you joking? <laughs> Ridley Scott has no complex about his own success. Do you consider yourself a kind of bankable, Hollywood grandee now. Like ever, that? Like that. Yeah, well, I wouldn't be allowed to do this. Are you kidding? The old geezer's doing this now. Mm. <laughs> Scott has a long list of epic movies that have become classics. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Gladiator. Alien. <laughs> Thelma and Louise. Officer. I am so sorry about this. Would you let go of that? Black Hawk Down. Oh, at us. We'll shoot back. Please, get out of the way. And Blade Runner, which bombed at the box office at first, but has become a cult classic. Has some of the stuff that you've done that you've liked best become some of the stuff that hasn't done quite so well if we're speaking in pure I, box office terms. I like terms. everything I've done. You love everything. Everything. And so I think you're all wrong. It's no accident that Sir Ridley, as he now is, has always made movies with powerful and lasting visual imagery. He's a trained artist who has always sketched out on storyboards exactly how he wants his movies to look. That infamous creature birth scene in Alien looked like this before it looked like this. Those gladiators were drawn on paper before they hit the big screen. And that Waterloo battle scene took almost comic book form before the cameras rolled. Roberta, George! George! The storyboards, he says, are what convinced investors to back his movies. That's the power of a storyboard, because the board... On the basis of, what, of the storyboard? On the board, the, the budget doubled. Hmm. They went, wow. Because they could see what it was going to look like. Yes. Interesting, a lot of the business is run by those who can't see it and those who try to see it. Odd in the movie business, I suppose. <laughs> again and again. <laughs> hey, Marco. Ridley Scott is 85 now. He didn't make his first movie until he was 40, having made TV commercials before that. And he's already got two more projects underway. One of them, Gladiator 2. You gotta keep on doing this. I'm yes. Yeah. What, why what, not? What do you got? I don't know. What do you got left to prove? Well, the fact I love doing it—that's mm -hmm. the difference. You won a lot of awards. You famously haven't won an Oscar. So yeah, but, so yeah. but you know. I really don't care. No. I mean, I, to me, to be allowed to do it is the most important reward. You know, um, I just love storytelling. 
especially stories like this. The battle is mine. There will be an end to the war. Up next, an exclusive excerpt from Mark Phillips' chat with Ridley Scott, something you can only see right here on Here Comes the Sun. Stay with us. I feel a responsibility of any film I do. As promised, here's more from Mark Phillips and Ridley Scott. I want to talk about your eye because, you, as you say, you came out of art school and you came out of advertising, yeah, yeah. then into films, and there's a, the connection between the two, the, this kind of graphic artist oh. in you connection. Would you say that that's been the way you've worked and your key from the beginning? Um, I was going to be a fashion photographer because at the Royal College, I got in in kind of graphic design, but in the college was David Hockney mm -hmm. and Kitage. And in the tea queue, the ham buns, sandwiches, queues with cigarettes, and mm -hmm. lots of students Remember might be on some morning. Today, a very famous painter who was then lecturing and teaching, such as Francis Bacon would be there and others. And so, and I was joined the queue as a, as a graphic designer. And I bought a camera, a cheap camera, and my diploma show, in those days you don't get a pass, you get a diploma. I got a very good diploma, I got a very good pass, first class honors, got a traveling scholarship. All my diploma was, show was black and white stills. And because I suddenly realized that David Bailey, major photographer in the 60s, 70s, and yeah. 80s, Terry Donald, who my age and making a fortune, and here I was, a student of some terrible little hovel in Earl's Court. So I thought, I want to be a fashion photographer. And I got a traveling scholarship. Uh, it, not a Fulbright, but that kind of thing. Mm. Where do you want to go? I said, New York. I want to see advertising. I want to see Madison, Mad Men. I want to see Madison Avenue. I went there and had a whole lineup of interviews. And I went to various agencies who loved my portfolio. And I, I went to a very famous photographer you might know Bert Stern. Bert Stern took the famous photographs of Marilyn Monroe where she crossed them out. If you can get one of those today, it's worth a fortune. Bert Stern, I got to New York. This is the difference in America then. I was having to live in the wine because my grant was not that big. So I have a pile of 25 cents on the phone. Ding. Can I speak to Mr. Stern, please? One moment. I'm talking to Bert Stern. Just like that. Hmm. And I said, I'm, I had, had the act. Blah. And he said, why don't you what are you doing for lunch? So I go for lunch with Bert Stern. He's leafing through my portfolio. And he's saying, and he lives in this two brownstone bolted together, which was magnificent then. And he said, you know, if you come back in a month, I'll give you a job as an assistant. So I was on. It's interesting because if I'd taken that job as a still fashion photographer, I know I'd have stayed with it because it's a great, kind of fun world. Mm. And it is an art form at his level. And I never did that because I discovered there's two documentarians who are famous, you might know them, is Don Pennybaker and Richard Leacock. Mm. And I knew that these guys had done marvelous documentaries. I'd seen one. And so I took my portfolio, and you don't do this on a traveling scholarship, and I stood at the, by this corridor next to a greasy spoon, waiting for these two guys to come in one way. I tracked down the office. The cab stopped. One called the other one done, the other one Rick, this is it. I let them pass, I followed them down this corridor with my big portfolio. And there's an elevator this big. And I said, can I come in? They went, okay, come in. By the time I got to the third floor, I had a job. <laughs> so I was aggressive. In Napoleon's terms though, do you, do you think he had that revelation past the point of his imperial success in terms of reorganizing France the way he did, in terms of creating modern Western Europe the way he did? I mean, probably the first major thing he was able to do as a young man was to look and reflect on the old guard who are, who are indulging and running France badly. Mm -hmm. Therefore, whatever was coming was almost justified, right? The revolution, the guillotining, and it, it, then it went too far. And I think he was amidst all of that and, and don't forget, he is poor Corsican, middle-class family, uh, who decided the only way to move up in life was to become a soldier. And so I think Napoleon probably was blessed with marvelous intuition. I've got intuition which has evolved over years. I've, 
and it's, it's a silly thing to say, you talk about the voice speaking to you, and it's not quite like that. You'd make a decision because something said to you, this is the right choice. Mm. And the more you do that, you start to acknowledge that, then you may find you've got a good intuition. It's a bit like putting your money on, on a certain card, right? I think you had a great intuition. And once you start to believe your intuition, that it's infallible, that's the moment it becomes dangerous because you're starting to leave the ground. And the key is that you've always got to keep your feet on the ground. And, and did he, or was there a point that you can point to? Where you no, I, I think he, he forgot. To lose I think he, he thought that he was, you know, omnipotent. And except in one area, which is what the film is partly about, is he, his fascination with Josephine. Do you feel a responsibility to the history or do you think you're into story? I feel a responsibility of any film I do. Um, Comedy is a thing you can put to one side because the only responsibility there is to make people laugh, which is hard. But when you are doing a film which is going to tackle violence, I was always shocked when I did The Alien. I would get bored with watching the audiences cringe and things. And one day I walked on the side in St. Louis a screening and there was a couple nearly under the seat in terror. Now, that's not healthy. And I, no, 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 I, I was For shocked. For them or you? Yeah. No, I was shocked. And so I, that right out there, it struck me, we have a responsibility as filming, because I think we, without question, good, bad, mediocre, or indifferent, we are influencers. Up next, here's the beef. There you go. Welcome back. The restaurant at the heart of FX's The Bear takes its inspiration from a Chicago sandwich institution, Mr. Beef. And just like on the show, it's a family affair. I saw firsthand how the second generation is keeping alive the beloved sandwich spot. We're down six sausage pepper, five greens, and a ravioli. Let's go. Last year, the FX series The Bear exploded off TV screens and into the hearts of foodies everywhere. I'm waiting on those peppers, chef. It's about an award-winning chef who comes back to run a Chicago sandwich stand after a death in the family. Cindy, head in the game. Are you kidding me? Are you? But it's really about how brutally hard it is to run a restaurant. Yes, lower your voice, please. Thank you. So sorry, guys. Thank you for your patience. The crazy sandwich shop is fiction, but it's inspired by something you can actually touch and eat. All right, buddy, what can we get you? Let me get uh, four beef. This is Mr. Beef. Juicy? Yes, sir. The place was both the inspiration for the bear. Here's a Polish and a monster. And the place where they shot the pilot. Walking in here is like stepping into the show. Your hot beef, buddy? Hot beef. And for the hardcore Italian beef eaters who line up day after day, it does not disappoint. <laughs> With a technique that took him 30 years to perfect, sandwich maker Freddie McGroom is poetry in motion. He literally flings the beef into a sliced roll and then dunks the whole thing in the pan juices. So there's not a dry bite in the house. Then it gets a few peppers and a double wrap in wax paper to keep it all together. There you go. Until you can make it back to the elegant dining room, find a seat, and devour. Oh yeah, it's messy, but people come from all over for this. And I mean all over. I'm not a great meat lover, and I ate so much, literally in about 30 seconds. It, he's never seen me devour a sandwich I like I did. I'm afraid to say yeah. it was delicious. Yeah, we, yeah. We, we, Seems it's always been that way. The first Italian beef is said to have been invented in the early 1900s by Italian immigrants who would make a cheaper cut of meat more palatable by roasting it, slicing it thin, and serving it up on Italian bread. Chicago native Joe Zaccaro started Mr. Beef in 1979 as a sandwich stand with a tiny kitchen and a tiny menu. And in 44 years, neither has changed that much. New at 10, the founder of the River North staple, Mr. Beef, has died, according to family. Joe Zaccaro died suddenly at age 69. 
His son Christopher was devastated, but he stepped up to run the family business. You know, we take time kind of peeling this off. Which is booming now like never before. We've been very blessed here because of that show, and it's all because of that show. That show, The Bear, was created by one of Chris Zuccaro's grade school buddies, Christopher Storer. And when Zuccaro first heard about it, he scoffed. So he said to me, I'm, I'm starting to write this show, and it's, I'm, I guarantee it's going to be based on this place. And I did say condescendingly to him, I'm like, oh, I bet it'll be a big hit. You, you said know, that? I did say that. <laughs> now I'm eating my words. We got issues. This arc was painted. The show gave Zaccaro his own shot at stardom, with a cameo opposite series lead, Jeremy Allen White. Add this. What am I, a coin star? It's like 300, 300 Gigi. plus what? But for now, he's keeping his day job. So we start off with this in the morning. And keeping right, his father's legacy alive. Each beef stand has a special ingredient they add to their Which beef. Which is? So I can't tell you what mine is. He didn't tell me, but it wasn't all that hard to guess. The secret ingredient at Mr. Beef is family. I'm blessed. I was blessed to have that man in my life. And I'm blessed with it. And I'm, that's all. Forget about all this, forget about the restaurant, whatever it was. I'm, I was just happy that that was my father. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. You guys have a good day. You too. Thank you. I'm Tracy Smith. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you here next time on Here Comes the Sun.